titled this presentation, All Great Companies Started as Small Companies. What I'd like to do is tell you a little bit about my journey on how I became a full-time private microcap investor. I'd like to then give you the case for microcap investing and then give you a little bit of an overview on the strategy that I utilize and then give you a couple of case studies and then tell you a little bit more about Microcap Club and the Microcap Leadership Summit. I started my journey in investing in 1997. Really to back up a little bit further, I'm 34 years of age today. I'm married and have a daughter, a three month old, so my life has definitely changed in the last three months. But I really got my start in investing when I was 16 years old, it was around 1997. I remember this time period fairly well because I was a sophomore in high school. And this is when my parents sat me down and really explained to me that they had saved for me approximately $25,000 that I could use towards my college education. This was all I was going to be getting, uh, so they thought they better give me an ample heads up to know how much I would be getting so I could better apply for whatever college or university I would want to go to. And because of that, you know, it was up to me if I wanted to spend that $25,000 on one semester in college or if I wanted to find a place that might have been a little bit more cost efficient to be able to string it out over all four years. And around the same time period, as you can imagine, 1997, 1998, the technology bull market was in full steam. And a lot of other people were getting interested in the markets as well because of that. And I remember talking to my parents' financial advisor at that point in time, and I was getting more and more interested in the market, in the stock market. He was telling me about these small cap technology companies that were just taking off, that were IPOing. This is exactly the same time I was trying to decide what college to go to. And so what I realized was that I could go to Millersville University, which was a university in Lancaster County and commute, and also work the equivalent of full time and be able to really pay for my tuition as I went. So I would be able to invest this $25,000 in small cap technology companies. That's pretty much what I did. I ended up going to Millersville University, then working full time for a financial advisor, not the ones my parents used, but another one that was there locally. It was a pretty big financial advisor. Actually, he had around 1,200 clients, around 200 million assets under management. And I was more or less hired to be a glorified secretary if you will, you know, answer the phones and do other marketing type things for that branch office. More or less, this was in 2001 when the internet bubble finally burst and I was fully invested in two small cap technology companies. I had taken that $25,000 and grew it up to around sixty dollars or $70,000. And then when the bubble burst, I ended up losing about 80% of that amount of money. And I think that's probably a similar story to a lot of other people that went through that time period, especially those that got into investing during the tail end of that technology boom. But losing 80% of my money wasn't the, really the biggest lesson that I learned out of that time period. It was really working for that financial advisor that I really got the, the biggest lesson up to that point in my life. Because I was answering the phones constantly, because I was working there almost every day during the week, when that technology bubble burst, when that internet bubble burst, you know, I swear I heard from every one of our 1,200 clients over the course of a three-month period in time. And every day, I would go into work, the phones would ring, and I'd just get the shit beat out of me every single day. People were angry, people were sad, and I just saw the full gamut of human emotion at that point in time. And I remember even getting threatened over the phone. We actually had to fire a few clients during that time period. So what I learned through that experience was really going into working for that financial advisor. I really thought that I would be a financial advisor. I would be a broker. But going through that experience just showed me that I really didn't want to manage other people's money. Because as we all know, you know, managing your own emotions is hard enough, let alone the emotions of others, the psychology of others, you know, hand-holding, especially for those that probably don't have the emotional constructs uh, to be able to handle the long-term market environment, the ebbs and flows, the bull and bear markets that uh, happen and occur over the long term. And that's really the point in time I can point to that says that I did not want to manage other people's money. I had to figure out a way how to really keep investing and also stay in the industry, in the financial industry, and figure out a way how to do this on my own. At the same time period that the internet bubble was crashing, I was starting to get more and more interested in microcap companies. I started looking at smaller and smaller companies. And I'd subscribed to a few newsletters during that time period. Through that experience, I stumbled upon a company that I really liked, and I don't know why I liked it. 
in hindsight because the fundamentals of this company were awful. But the company was XM Satellite Radio. Many of you probably know of XM Satellite Radio. It would later merge with Sirius Satellite Radio, and probably many of you have a Sirius Satellite Radio in your cars today. Back then, in 2001 and 2002, XM Satellite Radio was a microcap company. It was sub 200 million market cap. XM Satellite Radio just launched a bunch of satellites up into space. They had a pile of debt. They had no subscribers. They had no OEM agreements as well. And it was just really a company that was on the brink. The company itself, 40% of the shares were sold short. For whatever reason, this company really caught my attention. And I saw the CEO, Hugh Panero, was going to be presenting at a conference in New York City. I decided as a you know sophomore in college that I was going to get on a bus and go up to New York City to see the company present, to see the CEO present his story. And so I had fake business cards drawn up and uh, got on a bus and went to New York City. And I was able to hear that presentation. I was also able to have a one-on-one -on -one with the CEO at that point in time. And I really left that meeting really engaged. Ended up buying really XM Satellite Radio at $1.78 per share. I can remember the trade like it was yesterday. This was 99.999% luck. But I remember buying that stock and then over the next 14 months, the company started executing. And what would happen would be a historic short covering rally in XM Satellite Radio that would take the stock from $1.78 up to around $34 a share in about a 14 month span. And even though that gain was 99.9% .9 luck, uh, or maybe even greater, what I really gained out of that experience and the biggest lesson out of that experience was it, that's where my love affair with microcap investing began. And it was really because of the accessibility of management teams, the ability for a small private investor like me to be able to access management just boggled my mind. And I really thought that this was a place where me as a small investor could gain an edge over others. I graduated from Millersville University in 2003. I went right into an MBA program at Villanova. And when I wasn't sitting in the classroom at the MBA program, I was talking to other microcap investors, I was talking to microcap management teams. This is when I would first do my first company visits, traveling out to see companies' headquarters, meeting with management teams, really honing my craft of scuttlebutt research and things of that nature. By 2005, I had a real hard decision to make. Unlike other classmates of mine in the MBA program, you know, who got internships during the summer times that really made themselves more employable uh, when graduation time came around, you know, I didn't do anything like that. I was too busy, you know, researching stocks and talking to companies, and I really wasn't paying attention to the fact that the graduation date was looming. I needed to figure out a way how to stay in the industry that I loved, which was microcap investing, and also create an income stream for myself because I didn't have enough capital at that point in time to be a full-time investor. And so I decided to work for a consulting firm in New Jersey uh, that catered to microcap companies. After about six months of working there, I realized I could do this on my own, so I started my own advising business in 2005. And the main goal in the getting of the advising business was to get out of the advising business as quickly as possible. This was really just a means to an end. I just wanted to create an income stream for myself that would hopefully allow me time to snowball my portfolio. Really that point in time happened in late 2008 into 2009 when I felt I had enough capital to become a full-time private microcap investor. This is a chart that I penned for one of the blogs of microcapclub.com, but this really shows the investor maturation, or at least my investor maturation, which I think can probably be transcended onto a lot of other people as well. You can see in this chart the first peak. That's my XM satellite radio gain. You know, I think a lot of people have early success in investing. Uh, they think that they're the next Warren Buffett. You know, get ready. I'm going to make $5 billion in the next year or two. <laughs> and uh, I know that's what I thought about myself, too, coming off that game. But then reality kicks in, and then you start losing money. You know, your ego gets um, revalued, if you want to put it that way. And you really just learn the ropes by losing your money over and over again. I know that's how I did it. Many people like to believe that you can learn investing's greatest lessons by sitting in a classroom or reading a few books, and surely that can help you. But the biggest lessons in investing can't be learned that way. They have to be experienced. Fortunately, the best educator that's out there is losing money, and the best motivator that's out there is losing money. You now I can just speak towards my own past and my own history that that's certainly the case for me. I'd like to now give you the case for microcap investing, and this might not be new for a lot of people viewing this, but I think it will be helpful going forward. There's approximately 23,000 public companies in North America. 
are considered micro cap companies, having market capitalizations just under 300 million or less. So what you find is that 95%, maybe even 98% of investors focus on the small, mid, and large cap companies, those companies that have market capitalizations more than 300 million. And there's 12,000 of these companies that exist. But what you'll find is that investors are typically overexposed to these companies. And because of that, you have a lot of market efficiency in the companies that, that are up in these higher market cap classes. And you know these companies have 10, 20, 30 analysts that cover them. What we find is very few investors focus on microcap companies. It's the fact that they are small, illiquid, and they have low institutional ownership that creates the opportunity. But it's not the fact that microcap companies are small that creates the opportunity. It's actually the illiquidity that drives the outperformance in the microcap space. I think nothing best illustrates that than this chart in this slide right here. You'll see that small, illiquid companies returned the best annual performance since 1972 at 17.87 percent annually. If you look across to the right, you'll see that the worst performing market cap and liquidity threshold are actually small liquid companies. They performed the worst since 1972. So again, it's not the fact that these companies are small that creates the opportunity. It's really the illiquidity that presents the opportunity. And it just so happens that small micro cap companies are small and illiquid. A couple other statistics that I find that even experienced microcap investors aren't aware of. There's approximately 11,000 microcap companies in North America. If you were to combine all of these 11,000 microcap companies into a ball and form one company, that company would have a combined market value of 480 billion. That's just under the size of Google's market cap today. It goes to show just how small and large the microcap space is. If you would combine all 11,000 microcap companies in North America into a ball and form one company. That one company would be considered the North America's largest private employer, employing over 2.8 million people. That's more jobs than Home Depot, IBM, GE, Google, Berkshire, Apple, Pfizer, Microsoft, Cisco, McDonald's, GM, and several other companies that are here on the slide, all of those companies combined. The mainstream financial media and other pundits, if you will, they love to broad brush the microcap space as some uninvestable wasteland of sleazy, slimy companies that, taken as a whole, are rather insignificant. I think I've just showcased to you that the microcap space as a whole is very significant. I think it's a significant place for people to invest, and I think it's a significant place for the economy as well. Many people forget that the most famous and the best investors of all time got their start investing in microcap companies. Warren Buffett, Peter Lynch, Joel Greenblatt, and many others got their start investing in microcap companies. Many people forget the best performing companies of all time, Berkshire Hathaway, AutoZone, Netflix, Amgen, Celgene, Walmart, all started as small microcap companies. Walmart IPO'd in 1970 at a $21 million market capitalization. Even on a 2015 inflation-adjusted basis, Walmart would be considered a microcap company today. I love this quote by Charlie Munger, and he basically is talking about if he was a younger man, he would definitely be interested in trying to find and buying the Walmart when Sam Walton first uh, took it public in 1970. He would be very interested in trying to find these great companies early, get them when they're little. The best performing stocks over the last five years, a majority of these companies are microcap companies. Just like the title of this presentation, all great companies started as small companies, and that is a fact. And the key to outsized performance, outsized gains in your portfolio is finding these great companies early. Now, to give you a little bit more about my strategy, if you remember back to the slide where I showcased the, the 23,000 public companies in North America, and we had over 11,000 that are considered microcap companies, I'm really focusing on the bottom 15% of the microcap space. These are companies that have market caps less than 50 million. And believe it or not, there's still over 8,000 of these companies that exist in the marketplace today. If I were to explain my strategy in one sentence, albeit a run on sentence, I want to own the smallest, most illiquid, least institutionally owned, best businesses I can find that are run by intelligent fanatics. I'm a concentrated investor. I only want to invest in the best four, five, or six companies that I can find at any given time. I'm looking for quality businesses. I'm looking for businesses that, that can hopefully become great businesses. 
It is really a bet on the jockey strategy. The reason it's a bet on the jockey strategy is because the CEOs, the founders of these small micro cap companies, they wear a lot of hats. They're not only the CEO, oftentimes they're the COO, sometimes they're the CFO, sometimes they're the president of sales, the chief bottle washer, the garbage man, you name it. These management teams, and specifically what I find is the founders and CEOs wear a lot of hats inside those companies. So you better be sure that you're betting on the right jockey. I really have a long only strategy. I don't short stocks. I'm a long-term oriented investor, you know, holding these companies as long as they perform. And I really believe in qualitative analysis because I believe qualitative analysis is the edge in investing for all the reasons I gave you about betting on the jockey as well. And I believe it's a really constantly learning accumulation of knowledge on your positions, uh, on those management teams, on the businesses, on the industries is very important to my strategy as well. I would say these are like the, the five strategy principles or pillars to my strategy. Number one, know my investments better than most. And we'll get into this a little bit more later. But make as few investment decisions as possible. You want to set a high hurdle rate. Mistakes and errors occur when you go down quality because you were either bored or because you just get bored. Really, honestly, that's probably the number one reason why you go down quality. You want to keep your hurdle rate high. When you start looking at your investment checklist, and start investing in companies that have 7 out of 10 of the things you look for, or 8 out of 10. That's when mistakes and errors occur. I haven't bought a new investment in the last two years, and I refuse to go down quality looking for more investments just because I want to look at ideas and invest in new companies. Keep your hurdle rate high. At least that's one of my strategies. I want to invest in companies that are undervalued that can get overvalued. I'm not a deep value investor. I really do not want to own an undervalued company that will always be undervalued. I really want to find an undervalued company that can get overvalued. Great businesses always get overvalued because there's a scarcity of great businesses in the marketplace today. So I'm really looking to find undervalued companies that can hopefully get overvalued. I want to scale into my positions as my conviction builds. You know, I'm trying to find great companies early, but oftentimes greatness is not obvious when these companies are very small. So oftentimes when you do your analysis, your quantitative and qualitative analysis, you take a position and then you have to sit back and wait for management to execute. Let them prove themselves to you and then you end up buying more as your conviction grows. Some of my biggest winners were companies that I was constantly averaging up in. And I want to hold as long as management executes. This can be two or three days, <laughs> but uh, hopefully it's five or ten years or more. This is what I look for and why, and this is a very broad checklist of what I look for in companies. I'm looking for intelligent, fanatic econoclasts, and that is a mouthful, I know. I believe that uh, Charlie Munger is the one that really brought intelligent fanatics, that term, to light, but it really it's Sanjay Bakshi that is making it famous today. And Sanjay Bakshi wrote a great piece on his blog uh, several months ago talking about the intelligent fanatics of India. These owner operators of these businesses that most of them ended up, you know, growing these companies and creating significant shareholder value. These owner operators, these intelligent fanatics had an intense focus, integrity, energy and intelligence. And these owner operators, you know, owned a significant piece of the business, in most cases as well, you know, owning 10, 20 percent or more of those companies. These intelligent fanatics were also shared iconoclastic behavior. William Thorndike in the book The Outsiders devotes a big portion of the book to talking about how Henry Singleton and other people that were mentioned in the book had these iconoclastic behaviors. They didn't care what others thought about them. They didn't care what Wall Street thought about them. They didn't care about what the world thought about them. They really judged their performance by their inner scorecard. What I find is that a lot of the microcap winners that come out of the microcap space, the owner operators share this iconoclastic behavior and it's something that I look for. I'm looking for market leaders. And many people wonder, well, how can a microcap company really become a market leader? Well, it needs to dominate a small market. It's the old Peter Thiel zero to one approach. When I read Peter Thiel's book, Zero to One, you know, I kind of put it down when I was done with it and I said, wow, somebody actually summed up what I look for when I look for in my microcap investments. And it's what I do look for. I look for companies that are dominating a small market niche that is expanding rapidly. Because what you'll find is that the quality attributes that a market leader has, it ends up funneling down to the financials of that company. And specifically in the microcap space, when you find a market leader as a microcap company, it somewhat vets the management team because either that company created the market that they now dominate 
or they took share away from their competitors in that marketplace. And so it sh sort of showcases that management knows what they're doing. I also look for sustainable, profitable growth companies, companies that can grow 20% plus over the long term, profitable companies. And maybe even more importantly, companies that can self-fund their growth. A lot of companies can grow. Not many of them can actually fund that growth utilizing their own cash flows and become compounding machines. You're really looking for those compounding machines that are out there. And the reason why that's so important to the stock price as well is when larger money, larger pools of capital, specifically institutions, know that that company doesn't need to go raise money, sell equity to fund its growth. That means that those larger pools of capital need to go into the marketplace and buy those shares in the open market. And that's when you see some very big moves in the microcap space. I'm looking for companies that have low to no debt. What I've found is that microcap companies and debt just don't go well together. It's the old travel light, travel far philosophy. I'm looking for companies that have clean capital structure, a clean share structure. And maybe the best analogy I can use to kind of share with you why this is important is if you wanted to find out the most about me as a person, I would say you want to look at my bank statements because it would show you where I spend my money, what I spend it on, how much I spend. And it's the old, you know, your, your money follows your heart philosophy. You really get to see what type of person I am by looking at my bank statements. It's very similar to when you look at the capital structure and share structure of a company over time. The ability to go back three or four or five years and see how that management team, how that founder or CEO issued shares to see, you know, is it all common shares? Are there preferred shares? Does he have super voting rights? How did he finance the company? Was it with convertible debt? You know, how's he incentivized? Is it with a bunch of options or warrants? Did that owner operator buy his stake or was his stake, was his ownership position given to him or did he actually write a check for it? All of these things and watching how that share structure changes over time really tells you a lot about how that CEO and founder or management team operates that company. Because what you want to find is a management team and CEO that really treats their shareholders, their common shareholders, like gold. They don't issue shares frequently and freely. I'm looking for companies that have immediate upside. Like I said before, I want to find companies that are undervalued that can get overvalued. And lastly, I'm looking for companies that have no institutional ownership. If you remember back to that illiquidity chart, you'll remember that the worst place to invest is in small liquid companies. And those small liquid companies is just a fancy way of saying that they're institutionalized. What you want to look for is illiquid small companies. The best way I can put this is when you find a great business that nobody else owns, it only has one way to go, and that's up. How do you find these companies? This is a question I get asked quite frequently. And really, it's a combination of all of these things. I would love to say and point you to just one place that you need to go or one thing you need to do, but it's a combination of all these things. Word of mouth is a big one. It might be the biggest one. Private message boards, which is what Microcap Club represents. Public message boards, you know, Investors Hub, uh, used to be Raging Bull back in the day when I got started, uh, Yahoo Finance, things, other public message boards like that, Silicon Valley, Silicon Investor, I mean, searching filings, searching PRs. Uh, my partner at Microcap Club, Mike Schellinger, literally reads every PR and filing on every microcap company in North America every day. It sounds tedious and very manual, and it sounds like a lot of hard work, and it's all three of those things. But nothing can replace that manual and tediousness and hard work of searching filings and PRs. For example, I subscribe to the best screening software that's out there. It's very expensive. But I still find that a lot of companies fall through the cracks when I do microcap screens. And oftentimes it's the ones that fall through the cracks are the ones that you should be investing in. And so nothing can replace really just hard work and the tedious manual nature of looking through PRs and filings. And lastly, just serendipity. We have a member <laughs> on the Microcap Club that actually put a symbol of a stock in wrong, and he stumbled on another company. And he ended up investing in this company that he stumbled upon through serendipity and really liked what he saw. And it ended up being one of his biggest winners. Uh, I think it ended up being a 20 or 30 bagger for him. So even serendipity plays a role in how you find these companies. I'd like to now go through my analysis process. And so once you find a company, you know the analysis process begins. And it really starts with quantitative analysis. You want to look through all the filings, all the press releases, going back in time as far as you can. Microcap companies are mostly small emerging companies. Many of them don't have long operating histories. Some of these companies have been around for a year, some have been around for 10 years. But you want to go back as far as you can to try to get a gauge on how well that management team has executed. 
on how that company is positioned today. I oftentimes like going back to see what that management team has said in their MDNA to figure out you know, how much of what they said five years ago did they actually execute on? How is their uh, positioning of the company has changed? Also looking at the competitors, the peer analysis, looking at industry reports, really understanding the tailwinds in that business, the undercurrents driving that business as well. And really that's the quantitative approach to investing. And what you'll find is that 100% of experienced investors do quantitative research and analysis. But what you'll find is 20%, maybe 25%, actually do qualitative analysis and research. And that's why that really the qualitative analysis is the edge in investing is because so few people do it. And especially when you're analyzing small companies, qualitative analysis is really a must as well. And when I go through this analysis process, as you're kind of going from quantitative to qualitative to site visit to maintenance, you're adding more to your position, or at least I add more to my position, because mostly what happens is your conviction builds, or if you see something that you don't like, you just stop and you have a rather small position, you're able to get out of it rather quickly because you decided to get into your position slowly as your conviction built. But after the quantitative analysis, you move on to qualitative. And what I like to do is interview the company's management team. This can be one conference call, it can be a series of conference calls. You're really trying to gauge, really understand where that management team is positioning that company for the future. What I also like to do is talk to the large shareholders of that company. The reason I like to talk to large shareholders of companies is because they've usually been in the company a very long time. And so oftentimes you can pick up on different nuggets of information by speaking to these large shareholders, uh, stuff that's not exactly you know illustrated in press releases and things of that nature to try to gain an understanding of how well or not so well this company is executed over time. I would then look for what Paul Lounces would call trying to find that person, that third party person with differential insights, somebody that is really a expert in the business or industry of the business that you're analyzing and trying to find that person, searching for that person, and then interviewing that person to try to gain differential insights. I want to then perform industry channel checks, you know, the normal scuttlebutt research, talking to suppliers, customers, you know, where appropriate. Then after that qualitative analysis, then I would do a site visit. What this means is traveling out to the company's headquarters, meeting with management team on their own turf, if you will. And oftentimes it's the information that you get out of the conversation with management is sometimes not the best information you get. It's the, it's the other little things that you pick up with your other senses. You know, some things that you hear, things that you see. You know, for example, when you are meeting with management, does the CEO let anybody talk? Does the CEO let the CFO talk? Is it a dictatorship? When you are pulling into the headquarters, you know, does the CEO have his own spot that is marked CEO out front? Does he drive a brand new Mercedes? Does the license plate say, you know, I'm number one in the back? All these things give you little clues, you know, when you're touring the facility, is it marble floors or do they pinch their pennies? You know, do they really spend wisely or freely? Also love to talk to secondary employees. These are employees that would be right below the sea level. These folks that normally haven't been warned of my arrival to be nice to me. And what you'll find is these secondary employees also have worked for the competitors. So a lot of times you can gain really valuable insights by talking to some of these secondary employees on the competitive landscape, on what this company is doing differently. Uh, maybe on what the culture is like as well inside this company is very important. And also, like I said before, investigating the headquarters, the manufacturing, if they have a manufacturing facility there. You know, all of these things that you would never be able to get these little nuggets of qualitative kind of scuttlebutt if you just stayed in your office at your home. You can only gain these valuable insights by traveling and making a site visit. And once you get through the site visit, the due diligence doesn't stop. The analysis doesn't stop. The maintenance due diligence then begins. And it's really getting back to continuously accumulating knowledge on this position. You want to be an expert in this business. You want to accumulate knowledge on that management team, on that business, and on that industry. You want to be in a constant state of what Jim Collins, who wrote Good to Great, calls a productive paranoia. And the reason why it's so important is because the most important thing in microcap investing is to know your positions better than most. We all want to be able to tell our grandkids or our kids or our friends that we achieved a multi-bagger in the portfolio, that we remember this company that uh, we bought at X and sold at Y and it was a 10-bagger or a 50-bagger or maybe even a 100-bagger. But to achieve a multi-bagger in the portfolio, you have to hold a multi-bagger in the portfolio. And the only way you can hold a multi-bagger in the portfolio is to really fully develop the conviction to hold. 
and the only way you develop the conviction to hold is to know your positions better than most. The other reason why you want to know your positions better than most is because you're investing in small, illiquid companies. And so the key to investing is letting your winners run and cutting your losers as quickly as possible. And so part of knowing your positions better than most is really the fact that because of that, you'll have a heads up on being able to know when to sell before the masses. So when do I sell? And these are really the four reasons why I would sell. And number one is probably the most prevalent, which is you would sell when you find something better. I don't manage a fund. I don't have an RIA. I don't have clients. I'm a full-time private investor. So that means that to buy a new position, I have to sell an existing position. So what you're doing is when you're looking at new opportunities, you're constantly evaluating those new opportunities against what you already own. When you put in the time and energy to do the correct qualitative analysis into these companies, you know, it takes a few months. It takes a lot of time. And when you really develop that conviction in that company and into that management team, you really believe in their long-term vision of the company. When you look at a new opportunity, that new opportunity just can't be, you know, fractionally better than something you already own. It needs to be multiples better than what you already own to be able to sell something you own and trust to buy that new position. But it does happen. And oftentimes it's the biggest reason why you would sell a position is you finally find something that is a lot better than what you already own. I want to sell when the story changes. I have lost hundreds of thousands of dollars by not selling quick enough when I knew the story had changed. This is something that I'm still getting better at, and it's, uh, it's taken 15 years to get even half good at, but it's okay to fall in love with stocks, but you need to be prepared to divorce them quickly. I want to sell at the first sign of management incompetence or unethical behavior. Sometimes management teams make such a boneheaded move that you can't help but you know sell the stock. You can't Look at that decision they just made and sweep it under the rug. Because unfortunately, really bad decisions, it's, it's like the old cockroach theory where there's going to be a lot more coming behind them. And so oftentimes it's best to just sell your position when you see a company and management team make a really bad boneheaded move. And lastly, you want to sell when a company gets very overvalued. And I'm a firm believer in holding your positions, especially in the companies that are executing and doing well. But there are some times, and unfortunately it doesn't happen enough, but there are some times when a company goes up so far so quickly that it outstretches the fundamentals of that company and it just makes sense to take some off the table. I thought I'd include this chart, and this is really a snapshot of my portfolio. It's a very busy chart, so let me explain, but this will give you an idea of my holding period and position sizing. If you look on the right side, my sold positions, you know, if you look at Company F, the 5% next to Company F, that represents that Company F was a 5% position uh, in my portfolio, Company E a 5% position. If you look on the left column, my current positions, you'll see that Company A is 42% of my portfolio you'll see that company B is 33% of my portfolio. So currently, my top two positions are 75% of my portfolio. And most people that see this will say that this is completely insane and this is the riskiest portfolio ever. And this is where I would disagree with them because I think there's a, a firm bias against, for whatever reason, there's an angering bias towards people's cost basis. And when somebody is up a lot in something, they just want to sell it. One of the biggest mistakes I see is investors that sell winners to buy more of their losers. There is nothing wrong with letting your winners run. The, the reason why a lot of the companies that are doing the best in your portfolio are doing the best is because the management teams are executing. Quite frankly, they are the best companies. So why would you sell the best things in your portfolio? Why would you sell the management teams that are executing the best? Now, you don't lose track of the fact that you need to continue to make sure that you know these positions better than most. I firmly believe that of letting your winners run and cutting your losers as quickly as possible. William O'Neill said it best, take your losses quickly and your profits slowly because your objective is not just to be right, but to make big money. Again, these are case studies. I, I don't want, these are not recommendations to go out and buy Zag or Biosight or where food comes from. I really wanted to showcase these as examples of companies and can then go back in time to when we first started looking at them to see what commonalities we could pick up on. And what you'll find is, and this is a chart that I showed you earlier in the presentation, when you take out the errors, which are the ones that I put the red lines through, you're left with companies that have similar characteristics. And they're the common elements that I shared with you earlier in what I look for in my checklist. 
They had intelligent, fanatic, iconoclast CEOs and founders. They were market leaders in a small market niche that was expanding rapidly, that allowed them to expand into other niche markets or expand their own market. They had sustainable, profitable growth. And probably even more importantly, they were self-funding their growth. They didn't need to go to the capital markets to raise money via equity or debt. They had low to no debt. They had a very clean capital structure. A low amount of shares outstanding. A small percentage of their outstanding was uh, in warrants and options. They had all common shares. And lastly, they had no institutional ownership. The bigger money didn't own these companies yet. And so when these companies started to execute, started to perform, their stocks went up because the companies had to go into the market to acquire shares. Just a little quick overview on Microcap Club. It was founded in 2011, and really our number one priority is finding great companies early. We have around 145 members. Really, the club was formed to be an idea engine to really just turn over a bunch of these rocks. And we have over 370 companies profiled today. Over 50 of these companies ended up doubling or more since one of our members has profiled them internally. This is not a newsletter service. This isn't a pick of the month club. This is really about looking at these 11,000 microcap companies in North America and turning over rocks, trying to find these great companies early. We now have two ways that you can join. The subscriber view only access is about to launch here shortly, and that's gonna allow people to be able to view our private members forum to see what we're talking about. You can also become a a member by submitting a two-page, three-page investment thesis on your favorite microcap stock. Basically, the membership then votes on that application, and if you get enough votes, you get in as a member. We have around 145 members today. This is actually a low point in our membership, and I say that in a good way. We really focus on quality over quantity in everything that we do, including our membership. We have a very active participating membership on the club. It's just something that's taken four years to get to this point, and it's something that I get excited about logging in every day, and I know a lot of our members do as well. Lastly, the Microcap Leadership Summit is the, our inaugural Microcap Leadership Summit is gonna take place in 2016, and this is an event that I've been thinking about personally for over two years. And our mission of this event is to create better microcap investors and find great companies early. I wanted to find the best speakers that I could find to speak on a variety of topics that could make all of us better microcap investors, myself included. Unfortunately, some of the worst investors on the planet invest in the microcap space, from sleazy, slimy institutions that are just looking to do structured financing deals with these microcap companies to short-term minded, short-term sighted retail investors that, you know, the only time they want to contact management is to complain about why there's not more news coming out. We really need to look internally as investors and really up our game, you know, myself included. And so the really the goal of the first day of this two-day event is to create better investors. Day two, we're going to be bringing in a dozen or two dozen companies trying to find great companies early. And so that really concludes my presentation on microcap investing, on my journey, and I hope you gained some valuable insight from me doing so. Thank you.